Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermeulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. We'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Our webinar today is entitled Transition Planning and Resources During COVID-19. Our presenter today is Brian Keeney. Brian is the Southern Regional Transition Coordinator for the Transition Improvement Grant. This is his ninth year with TIG, and he is passionate and dedicated to helping youth, educators, agencies, and families learn more about transition planning and programming that increases youth outcomes. It is my great pleasure today to introduce to you Brian Keeney. Brian? Thanks, Bonnie, for the awesome introduction, and I'll uh, reiterate the the fact that we're um, pretty close to going into a year um, being in pandemic mode. And with that being said, um, this has been a particular challenge for school districts um, and families uh, of youth uh, with disabilities. Um, we're doing our very best to to serve those individuals. Um, as best as we can as a grant. Um, our grant is the Wisconsin Transition Improvement Grant. We're a regionalized grant, so we have regional coordinators throughout the state. Uh, we have an administrative assistant and we have a grant director, and we have somebody that oversees our project um, at the Department of Public Instruction. Um, if you're interested in learning more about TIG, um, we often refer to ourselves as TIG, so a transition improvement grant. Um, you can go to our website, which is www.witig.org. Um, very similar to FACETS, all of our trainings and resources are free of charge. Um, so we primarily, our focus is to support school districts in their transition planning and programming for youth between the ages of 14 to 21. One of the big things that's been happening is the need for school districts to have specialized resources to online plan for youth. Um, school districts are either uh, fully operational in the district, uh, they have a hybrid model, or they're fully um, virtual. So the hybrid model is somewhere in between virtual and face-to-face. -face. Um, that's a particular challenge for families and for youth for agencies um, and everybody's doing their very best. So hats off to special education in general because we've been doing a great job with trying to keep people um, you know, on the train tracks. The resource that I'm gonna talk about today is um, something that we created that's a web-based tool. So it's all online. Um, you can see it on my screen. We created something in Padlet. Uh, Padlet is a, a web-based tool. You can see where I'm hovering my mouse in the upper left-hand corner. This is where we're housing our supporting transition for youth using online platforms. Resource directory, we are using Padlet. Here's the link to the Padlet. I shared it in the chat, so if you want to grab the Padlet out of the chat, I'm sure Bonnie will send it out as a post-webinar link it's very easy for others to access the padlet you don't have to have an account you just need the internet access and then you're able to navigate the padlet i know that bonnie put the padlet into um, the webinar as a pdf um, that will be a useful tool because then you can see all the different categories so what i like about padlet is everything is left to right um, so we have resources that have a heading. So as you can see, the resource on the far left is education and training resources. And then the next category is employment. And then we move into independent living, recreation and leisure. And these are kind of our big three within the post-secondary transition plan. Every student that has a IEP in Wisconsin school districts is required to have a post-secondary transition plan between the ages of 14 all the way up until the time that they exit. Sometimes that can go all the way through their 21st birthday. The big three that are in the 
post-secondary transition plan are planning for post-secondary education and training, planning for post-secondary employment, and planning for how a student is gonna independently live and manage maneuvering their communities so that they can specifically tap into uh, recreation and leisure activities and other types of activities. So we put those as the first three categories. I'll dive a little deeper into each of these after I kind of go through the headings. Because we're in a time where virtual learning is still a big part of what we're doing, um, obviously everybody's looking forward to going back to full face-to-face -face instruction, but we're just not there yet. Um, the fourth heading is virtual learning supports. And there's just a ton of things that are out there, but we wanted to pick things that we thought were best practice. That's kind of our true focus as a grant is we don't just want to dump resources into this Padlet. We want these to be things that are going to be useful and practical and up to date for educators, families, students, and agencies to access. And then we have our state and national partners. Um, this is really important because everybody in our state that serves individuals with disabilities is doing their very best to try to provide resources. And we wanted to come up with a, a way we could incorporate those state and national partners into our Padlet. So we did that. Obviously, mental health and social and emotional learning is a big, huge topic. Um, it's always been a huge topic, but right now it's an even bigger topic just because of the levels of stress um, and uh, the change that's happening on a daily basis sometimes with um, students and school districts and families and agencies. So that's a, a section. And then our last section is health and wellness resources. Um, we're, we're usually updating this on a, on a weekly, if not, you know, at least bi-weekly basis. Usually it's weekly. And we add in new resources. Um, we typically do not add in new headings. We're sticking to kind of the, the ones that we have here. But I'm just gonna go through each of the sections. And then Bonnie, I'll if, please ask questions. Uh, if you have resources that you have accessed that maybe belong in here, um, please feel free to share those with Bonnie and we can talk about those when we have our weekly meetings um, to try to see if, because by no means is this a, that we have found everything that belongs here. Um, we've, we've done our best, uh, but there might be things that are missing. The first thing that comes to our mind when it comes to education and training resources is our Wisconsin Transition app. And maybe some of you have seen this before, but all you have to do to access the Padlet is simply click on the particular area that you want to access. And for some reason, it's prompting me to want to um, download the resource. That may not be how it'll work for you. It could be that it's wanting to do that because we're in webinar mode. Uh, but the Wisconsin Transition app is a, a tool that we created in our state. Um, we're one of very few states to have this product. It's, a, it's an application that can be used on an iPhone, an Android device, um, or a web-based tool. Um, I'm just going to go to our transition app. Sorry, typed it in wrong. Just so I can show you what it looks like. If you can see my screen, um, which hopefully you can, Bonnie, can you see the internet site that I just went to? Yes, I can. Okay, so this is our web-based transition app. Earlier, I was talking about how each student 
um, that has an IEP between the ages of 14 and 21 has to have a transition plan. The purpose of this product is to help families and youth better design their own plan. So it's more of a individualized transition plan that a youth can sit down with their special education teacher, their case manager, their parents, and they can create their own transition plan. And it's very user-friendly. It allows me to start my transition plan. You have to complete this in one sitting and it asks you a series of questions. You simply answer the questions, check the boxes, and you can send this as an email to your teacher, to your case manager, to your DVR counselor. You can include anybody who's on your collaborative transition planning team and you can share your app with them. And the beauty of this is it allows students to share their voice and capture their true passions, preferences, and interests so that it can be you know, captured by the IEP team uh, and, and they become more of a self-advocate by doing this. Uh, now more than ever, this is really important, especially when kids might be virtual uh, because it's really hard to connect with a student about what their plan is when we don't capture their true voice. So the transition app has been a very powerful uh, tool for many of our youth and their families. And it allows them to be more prepared for the IEP meeting. Um, so the transition app is probably our most popular product. I'm moving down the column and the, the rows that are within it. Um, the next thing that we have in here is Zello. Most school districts in Wisconsin are using Zello as a product to do academic and career planning with students. Uh, Zello is a web-based tool that contains a whole variety of supports for students uh, to gain access to career awareness, interest inventories, um, they can create a portfolio. Um, we have our own customized um, Zello site for the state of Wisconsin. It's really important for families to know this because this is where students will be going. Uh, all students in Wisconsin, whether or not they have a, an IEP or not, this is specific to everybody, um, has access to Zello. So this Zello site works really well with providing insight into the post-secondary transition planning around the education um, preparation that a student might need uh, to reach their desired outcome. There's many other tools in here also. Um, I obviously won't have time to go through everything, but I can at least show you how to access everything that's in this column. And we have lots of resources here. iTunes has put together a really good instructional support system around education and training for youth. Um, and it's very user friendly when you mention iTunes to youth, uh, usually their ears and their eyes will perk right, will perk right up um, because it's associated with music. Uh, this Work Life Ready um, is an online Toolbox, it's a toolkit that youth and families can access that has loads of products. Uh, some are uh, free and some are um, things that have a cost, uh, but this is, this is a really popular tool. It comes out of the Dakotas and it also serves Minnesota and Wisconsin. So that's why we put that in there. Um, ways that students can best be supported for remote learning. Loads of resources in here. We put some TED Talk resources in here. If you haven't had a chance to listen to a TED Talk, um, TED Talks are amazingly inspiring. Um, so we wanted to include that. 
any students that might be going on to college. Um, a lot of colleges have had to change the way they do business uh, because they can't necessarily have lots of kids on their campus doing tours. They've had to do virtual um, tours. Here's some really good resources from the Think College program. Think College is specialized college training for individuals with uh, more significant uh, disabilities. They have over 250 programs around the nation and their primary uh, objective is to serve individuals with more significant needs and they have um, several Think College programs uh, within our state in Wisconsin. So this is a, a resource we wanted to share. If you haven't already looked into Transition Tennessee, obviously we want to showcase the great stuff that we do in Wisconsin, but Tennessee has amazing resources uh, for transition. I would highly recommend this website. Uh, highly recommend. Transition Tennessee puts out some really good stuff, uh, not just COVID-19, but they have some great resources. Uh, you do have to have a user account to access um, their materials. You can see there's a login section here. You just click there and it'll prompt you to create a username and a password. They don't necessarily want to charge anything. They just want people, they want to know who's using their site. Um, one of the kind of founding folks for Transition uh, Tennessee is uh, an individual named Eric Carter. And Eric actually started his journey in transition in Wisconsin and was working at the Wiseman Center and he left to go to Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. Um, that was a big loss for our state, uh, but he's doing great things in Tennessee. Um, so that's why we wanted to put the Transition Tennessee uh, toolkit. They do some really good stuff around transition planning and programming, just like we do. And there's a couple other resources that are within the education and training uh, section. And this is specific information to post-secondary education and training and ways that students can start preparing for that journey to happen while they're in high school. So Bonnie, any particular questions around um, that first uh, column? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, um, in the second column, we start moving into employment. Um, this is often a tricky area for um, special education teachers to um, assess what is a student likely going to do when they leave high school when it comes to employment and we want to start this ball rolling when students are in middle school and I know um, I'll just speak really quick about my own son um, I have an 11 year old and I have an eight year old daughter my 11 year old is a boy and I'm starting to discover their transferable work skills now um, things that they really desire to do with their free time, things that they gravitate towards. Uh, my daughter loves animals. So that's what we're really pushing right now. And this is really kind of the big focus with employment is to, to really kind of help students discover what they're passionate about in terms of um, how they like to spend their free time, uh, what they gravitate towards, um, what they like to learn about, and then use that to start planning for what they might want to do when they exit high school. And obviously, when you're looking at a sixth grader, um, they have six years of time that's going to expire between, you know, sixth grade and exiting, let's say they left as a senior. So things change, but as students start to get closer to you know, earning their diploma, this really starts to get narrowed and dialed in a little bit more. And that's why we really pride ourselves in Wisconsin at starting at 14 with some of these employment 
tidbits for students and start really exposing them to some of these platforms. Um, these are things that work really well with COVID-19 and online, but they also work really well when students are back in the classroom. Um, obviously, we put the transition app in Zello here, just like we did in uh, education and training. So we duplicated because they speak into both. We'll start going into um, Career One Stop is a great resource. I really like uh, some of their videos that they have that help students better understand uh, 16 different career clusters. If you're not accustomed to uh, the career clusters that we have, um, there are 16 clusters and within each cluster there's pathways. So thinking about my daughter, um, you know, she's really kind of in this science, technology, engineering, and math cluster, and that's where she would be, you know, kind of steered in that direction. Um, my son really likes police shows. He likes DNR, game warden shows. He likes the um, that forensics science type stuff. So he's probably more, you know, gravitating towards um, a completely different cluster. He's in this law, public safety and corrections cluster. So this is the big part of that employment journey is learning how to kind of direct traffic. Um, and the traffic looks much different for a sixth grader than it does for an eighth grader, a ninth grader, a tenth grader, all the way through potentially age 21. So these these videos are really good. Um, there's some career quizzes that are very visually um, pleasing for students that are um, within this section as well. Um, I've been doing a lot of research as part of my work with informational interviewing. Uh, informational interviewing is a game changer for students, um, especially now, um, being that we're limited in our ability to do face-to-face -face job shadows, uh, where kids can really learn more about the day-to-day -day operations of a job. An informational interview is uh, something that is set up between a student and um, a business or uh, a job site and the informational interview is done in a very organized manner where there's a series of questions here's some sample questions that uh, are within this career one-stop site and students can pick the questions that they want to ask based on what they want to know uh, so if i was interviewing a nurse that worked in an er and that might be an area of interest for me. I would want to ask that nurse some specific questions that would get me the information that I need to further either A, want to explore that career more, uh, B, want to be a little bit more curious about is this something I want to continue to explore, or C, cross it off my radar. Um, the beauty of this is when students learn to cross something off their radar at a young age, that's a powerful thing because they can start to explore something different um, where you don't get trapped in something that isn't right for you. Um, I had a student one time that she had her heart set on wanting to be a veterinary technician, uh, a vet tech, and we sent her to a job shadow at a vet tech clinic and she was observing um, spading and neutering of um, cats and dogs. And she came back to school at the end of the day and she was almost in tears. And we were, we were very distraught about that. And she said, I don't wanna do surgeries. I don't like seeing animals suffer. And so we took that as uh, a success because we knew that that was the wrong 
career pathway for her to continue investigating. And then we looked at other pathways within that cluster and found out that she wanted to take care of animals. Um, so this is a student that I know very well, and she works at Timbavati um, as an animal caretaker. And that is her career right now. And she makes really good money and um, she loves her, her work and she saved herself uh, the, the possibility of going to school to be a, a vet tech and then not wanting to enter, in, enter into that field. Uh, so the informational interviews can really be powerful for students and they can be customized. So if you have a student with a more significant um, disability, you can use technology to help them through that interview. Um, everybody can do an informational interview. There's just a matter of uh, supporting the student to be able to complete that. Uh, very powerful. Uh, virtual field trips are kind of a cool thing. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to take a field trip without having to get a bus and kind of disrupt your day by getting, getting to the event. So something good that's coming out of our uh, COVID pan pandemic is uh, learning different ways of doing things. So this is kind of neat. Explorework.com, very similar to Career One Stop. Uh, lots of videos, lots of resources. Uh, the student career info site is kind of cool. Allows students to look at resources, um, gain access to presentations. It's very visual and very easy to navigate. It's full of videos. Allows students to enroll in ITV courses that might be very specific to a certain subject area, uh, might be specific to a certain topic. Um, I really like this site a lot too. That's why we put it um, put it in there. Let me just close out of some of these so they don't start taking up my entire screen. Uh, this virtual job shadows is really cool. Um, that comes out of Inspire um, Sheboygan. So after a student does an informational interview and they really feel strongly that I wanna, I wanted to go on a job shadow now because I feel like this is something I wanna explore, you know, deeper. Then you set up a job shadow um, and you can do these virtually, very similar to how colleges are doing virtual um, tours. We're getting really good at webcams and how to use drones and capturing the big picture of a, a job site. So job shadows are really evolving into, yes, face-to-face -face job shadows are the best. I mean, we always want to default to that, but if we can do a virtual job shadow, um, that's a bonus. Uh, we put the DVR youth and transition video in here because it's a powerful tool for families to learn more about the division of vocational rehabilitation and how they can support a student's employment journey um, by providing them uh, resources and supports to figure out how to eliminate or support barriers to employment that might be encountered by youth. So DVR is doing some really good things uh, to try to adjust to the pandemic as well as all of our state agencies. And then here's another virtual job shadow resource. I'll just kind of click on this and you can see it's really gives students, they're using drones uh, to try to capture like really intense parts of a job to get students inspired about learning more. Everybody deserves the opportunity to do a job shadow, whether it's a, a student with a specific learning disability that 
maybe only sees their special education teacher very rarely for just a few supports and services to a student with more significant challenges. Um, we want all students to chase after their education and training dreams and their employment dreams. And we feel very strongly that that's something that the more uh, you can expose students to these different resources, the better they will adjust to finding what their meaningful day is gonna be like when they leave high school. So questions at all about education and training or employment before I move into kind of the, the, the last of the top three in the post-secondary transition plan, which is independent living. Any questions at all, Bonnie, or anything? Not at this time, Brian. Okay. The third section is the probably the one of the most important things to consider for for youth in their transition journey is um, how are they going to how are students going to live independently and learn how to navigate their community and access different things. Um, just an example, I I seek great joy in sitting down at a coffee shop and talking to two or three people or even four about anything over a cup of coffee. Uh, that's an example of rec leisure. That's a leisure activity for me. Uh, somebody with a disability wants to be able to access those leisure activities in their community. Um, this is an inspiring video that we put together as a grant team about how to create self-advocates. Because when you can self-advocate, you can tell people what you need, why you need it, and how you need it. And that's really powerful. Um, we also created a tool through our grant to help uh, teachers and families as they're working with their sons or daughters that have a disability, have an IEP to learn. What are some things that we need to be doing to help create independent living goals for, for students? And we came up with a, kind of a checklist. This is powerful. Uh, this is by no means an end all product. We look at this every year to try to adjust it, add in some different things. Um, and we kind of came up with kind of seven different areas that we felt were very important for um, for teachers um, and and families and agencies and and youth to to learn about. Um, one is navigating your community. Two is how are you going to live a healthy life? How are you going to stay safe and make good decisions? How are you going to communicate? How are you going to address transportation, personal finance, and living and housing? So these are really important goals for students to incorporate into their IEPs. And this resource helps give some guidance to further direct uh, that work. So we wanted to make sure that we put that uh, in here. This is kind of an independent living checklist that is really helpful. Um, it's got two different sections to it. So we put one below the other. How to support students in their journey to rec leisure. This is a really good resource that is also kind of a, modif uh, a combination of a question and answer and a checklist. Brian? Can we go yes. back to the one that you just talked to about the independent living goal checklist? Um, so someone is asking, it looks like a great thing to include in IEPs and lots of times 
Um, it's frustrating when parents suggest there are things that they would like to have included in an IEP. This looks like a wonderful thing to go through during the course of an IEP meeting. Um, do you have some suggestions about how to phase this into an IEP meeting? Yes, that's a, this is exactly why we created this because when we look at post-secondary transition plans, oftentimes independent living uh, is required to be discussed, but you can check it's not needed. Um, we wanted to give teachers, families, students some resources to be able to say, yes, we need to discuss this. Um, I think probably the best thing to do is uh, introduce this resource to the case managers as a family. Um, I'm assuming this question is coming from, um, from parents. Um, have knowledge of this resource, and this is in the Padlet, so you can download it. Um, if you wanted to download something, you simply just click the download button, and you can see how it's allowing me to download it as a PDF. And bring this to the IEP meeting um, to incorporate it into that section of the IEP. It's a required topic to talk about in the PTP. Um, just don't allow it to be bypassed. Um, this is an important topic. So we wanted to create this resource to allow for some conversation to take place around these seven areas. So hopefully that's somewhat helpful. I think it's it's important for an IEP is a team, and there's no person on that team that can't suggest an idea. Um, so just because it doesn't come from the case manager who's running the IEP meeting per se, uh, doesn't mean that it can't come from a student or a family or an agency. Hopefully okay, that thank helps. You. That's great. Thank you very much, because it looks like a super um, useful tool. It is, and um, that's why we created it. We felt like this was an area that was deficient in IEP meetings where, you know, I like, again, I'll go back to my own kids. Um, they need independent living goals, um, regardless of somebody having a disability or not having a disability. Um, What's good for one is good for all, sometimes is what we say. Um, everybody needs post-secondary independent living goals. I think back to my college days and how I struggled with financial management or um, knowing how to you know, make my own medical appointments or think about filling a prescription, you know, whatever it might be. Um, this is important for, for us to discuss. Hey, thank you very much, Brian. You're welcome. Uh, financial management is a big topic, so we put some things about budgeting and uh, ways you can manage financial resources and teach people the basics of financial management. Uh, this is kind of neat. Um, the ARC <laughs> of Wisconsin created uh, some really cool resources to support um, people with uh, more significant intellectual and developmental disabilities. And you can see, obviously, they've got classes and many of them have started already. Um, this one starts in April. They do have a cost, um, but what I've been told is that uh, and don't quote me on this, but if you're working with long-term support, um, there's a possibility that there could be a discussion about how you can use some of your long-term support funding to help offset the cost of these courses. And these are two really good topics. And I'm not, I'm not thinking that this is going to be uh, the end of their journey with these courses. I think. Uh, assuming this one goes well, it's already underway. Obviously, they're probably into 
you know, less than six or seven by now. If this goes well, I think this is going to be more popular. Um, so kudos to the ARC for creating these courses to support um, youth and their families around this more significant uh, disabilities to provide more resources so and more training. Brian, I have a comment from somebody, an uh, informational comment uh, saying that the regional centers have training available for parents about medical planning for independence as well. Yes, and uh, Tim Markle and I were just discussing that. Um, and that resource is also in our Padlet. So I'm glad that that um, topic got brought up um, because I just not too long ago became aware that they were um, that they were doing that around healthcare and um, accessing health uh, related resources. So that's, this is all stuff that probably, I can't say this, you know, 100% for sure, but because of the pandemic, we've had to rethink a lot of things and this is gonna be a good thing that we now have these new products that maybe wouldn't have gotten created had we not have gone through this difficult time. So thank you, Bonnie. If you haven't seen this, this is really cool. I don't think it's going on right now. I think the camera is turned off, but if you haven't seen the Decora Iowa Bald Eagles camera, um, this is pretty cool. This is a pair of eagles, a male and a female that uh, have a nest in Decora, Iowa, and they they turn on the camera during their process of when they um, have their 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 babies, and you can see the journey of how the mom and the dad take care of the babies and leave the nest to go get food and the the growth of the babies. My kids tuned in every single day uh, to want to watch the bald eagles. Um, caring for their young. So this is kind of neat. Uh, here's some virtual tours of zoos, uh, national parks, museums, some more free resources. Um, Transition Tennessee is doing some really cool things on uh, student lesson plans. It was listed as coming soon. I'm thinking that that is not the case anymore. Uh, they now have these resources. Again, you have to have account, an account to access them. I want to go to work. You click here. It shows you all the things that you need to be doing to learn how to go to work. I want to go on for more education after high school. Some kids want to do both. Um, we're going to be creating something like this. Um, the cool thing about our grant is we we like to be cutting edge. So if somebody's doing something really cool in another state that's supporting uh, a student journey to better outcomes, we're going to probably want to do it in Wisconsin. That's Bonnie, I'm sure you can appreciate that. I know Bassett's is kind of wired the same way. So that kind of concludes the independent living section. Um, this is pretty robust. These three sections are probably the most popular. And then we kind of move into the, the, the last uh, four sections are um, kind of a really important as well for us to discuss and that's virtual learning supports we always start out with our DC, our dpi um the supports because they're the state agency that is oversees education in our state of wisconsin so we included uh dpis teaching and learning supports for the virtual um, pandemic and here's some covid 19 um resources that dpi put out because we're using so many different virtual platforms, obviously today we're using GoToMeeting. Our grant um, uses Zoom. 
we put some tutorials about the different virtual uh, products within this section. And we have some teacher tips about how to capture youth's attention when you're in an online environment. Uh, Edutopia has some really good resources about giving tips to teachers. Um, they have like a daily tip. How to establish a really good routine with students when you are trying to get their attention when they're not face to face. Um, this has been difficult uh, for everybody. I know I go through Zoom fatigue on a regular basis uh, because I'm on Zoom so much or go to meeting. So we wanted to build in a section that just gives good support about virtual access because it is it is what we're doing right now. And then we have a lot of resources around state and national partnerships um, because we're not in this alone. We're collaborating every day with, I mean, obviously I'm on this webinar today, which is brings joy to my day. It's right in the middle of my day. So this is perfect timing for me to be able to reach an audience that is through facets. Um, so uh, TIG and facets, collaborate on a regular basis. Um, lots of our coordinators are doing virtual meetings with other different agencies. So uh, our state and national partners are all doing things to move their work forward. So we wanted to capture that. Uh, it's important now more than ever for educators to continue to, to do trainings, to better their craft, um, most people now are having to do online conferences. Uh, career and technical education in our state, if students are doing youth apprenticeships, um, looks a little bit different um, because we're not able to go into job sites and manage um, students who are doing apprenticeships to gain work skills uh, to meet the demands of the labor market. We had to really develop some specific policies in Wisconsin about how do students who are doing apprenticeships gain their credentials. Here's some transition resources that come from the National Center on Transition, um, which is NTACT. NTACT is our governing kind of national body. Um, so we pay very close attention to what they put out and we want to make sure we push those resources out in our state as well. So we put some really good resources about uh, NTACT and how they're helping states respond to the pandemic. I mean, here's some webinars that we wanted to promote. Uh, the Transition Coalition has some really good webinars. Um, uh, DCDT, um, obviously, uh, Facets has their webinars, which are outstanding. So we would be foolish not to be um, putting all of our state partners in here. You can see this is Tim Markle and what Bonnie was referring to. I think there was a question about um, Healthcare updates, because this is such an important topic. Um, we wanted to make sure we included uh, a snapshot of how um, Forward Health and Wisconsin Wiseman Center in conjunction with um, Tim Markle's work and the centers around Wisconsin that help families learn more about uh, healthcare and health access in Wisconsin. We uh, put that in here. Uh, the Board for People with Developmental Disabilities put together a, a Living Well Toolkit. So we incorporated that uh, into our Padlet. This is a great resource. I wish I could go through all these individually, but I wanna make sure that I 
respect time and leave about five minutes for questions. So I'm at about the 10 minute mark. Lots of stuff in here about how we can continue to engage students while they're at home. This is a concern obviously for school districts that this is not best practice, we know that. Um, we have data to back that up, that virtual learning is not the best way for us to deliver instruction, but it's the way that we need to be doing it. So we have to do it to the best of our ability. And we have lots of resources here to help with that process. Whether it's specialized software, um, doing certain activities while we're on virtually with students to capture their attention and uh, continuing to access the community and deliver the services and supports that are in the IEP to the best of our ability. Social emotional learning is a hot topic right now. It always will be. Uh, so we have lots of resources here to help students, families, school districts, uh, develop a better plan for how to access the right resources to help families continue on their mental health journey for students themselves. Uh, teachers are struggling with their own uh, mental health. I just talked to a teacher today that said that they didn't check one email over break and it was the best thing that they ever did and now they're they're back today um, or they were back Monday and now they're ready to tackle going out and doing that work that they need to do to help families and youth and they're not burned out right now. They're kind of getting their second wind. So things like that are so important. And being well, being healthy. Um, here's uh, the tool that uh, Tim Markle uh, put put in here for us. Um, this is, comes from the center. Um, this is a workbook for youth. This is great stuff. This comes out of Wisconsin Community of Practice work, work on transition and healthcare. And it incorporates lots of different things that families need to consider. And so do school districts about your health and your well being is very important. Kids yoga, this is really good. Um, there needs to be an adult version of that too. And just ways you can stay engaged and stay healthy because if you're not healthy, um, you're not going to deliver a quality product to the people that you need to serve. And right now, our focus is on serving youth and families with special needs. So that is kind of the 10,000 foot view of the Padlet. I know I went through this really quick, uh, but the more you play in here, now you have access. That's the most important thing is we get you the ability to access this material um, and you can use it. Uh, when we update it, you'll see that we'll change the date here to reflect that we had gone in and we either added something or we deleted something that no longer was relevant. Um, then that's important that we do that. So, so questions? Brian, any? Yeah, I ha I have a comment for you, and and maybe you can elaborate on this too. Um, this is an excellent piece of work, and um, we need to thank Tig for the work they've done to put a lot of these resources together. The comment is, how do we get this in the hands of the right people so that they know that all of this stuff is out there for them to recognize? I think. That is a really good question, and I like these tough questions because this is the kind of stuff that we're we're wanting to be better, and everybody is working to be better. So it's a partnership. I think every school district probably has a pipeline, uh, a networking group that allows parents to uh, freely express 
concerns, um, offer tips and strategies, uh, be a team player. Uh, so there's a parent advocacy group likely existing in every community. Um, most districts have a family liaison. Um, it's a parent that uh, collaborates with the school district uh, to bounce ideas between the district and the families and create that streamlined pipeline that's very transparent where information is flowing between families. Uh, if, if a teacher doesn't know something exists, uh, share it with them. Um, share it through email, share it through networking meetings. Um, I'll just give a great example of something that exists in Middleton. Uh, Middleton's a big school district in Dane County. Obviously, uh, they have a parent support group called Spark, um, and they meet, I believe they meet monthly. And it's a group of parents that uh, they they meet with the district. So it's um, oftentimes district staff come, and it's not a group of people being mad. It's not a group of people wanting to, uh, you know, shake their fist or uh, be disgruntled. It's a group of people that come together to offer best practices and we want an outcome for our students. So I think those are really healthy ways to uh, relay information is bring it to the people who are uh, part of a team. An IEP is not just a school, it's community resources, partnerships, it's parents, it's youth, it's everybody that's trying to prescribe the outcome for the student at hand. So I hope that answers that question. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think this is a valuable piece of information for a lot of people, and I think there are wonderful resources that are included. So we thank you for taking the time today to show people what's available out there. Do you have any closing comments, Brian? I, I'm looking at my clock right now, Bonnie, and I've used my entire hour. I'm proud of myself for doing that. <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure that I, I spent the whole hour talking about the, the resources, the importance of the, the big three. Uh, I think it's really important that we think about what a student can do versus what they can't. Um, there is no such thing as a low functioning student. There is only students who will function more highly with supports. So we need to reframe our thinking. Uh, we need to think about every student is employable. Um, there is an employer out there that doesn't know what they don't know. And when they meet a student, maybe that has more significant challenges, um, they will find a way to uh, bring them into the fold. Um, we just have to really think about what is the meaningful day for, for a student? What is that gonna look like? How do we work with families uh, to make that happen? Um, and it's a journey. So I, I think that's my closing idea. Okay, well, thank you very, very much, Brian. This is certainly worthwhile in reviewing. And I know that I have found some resources that I didn't know anything about before. So I greatly appreciate your comments and your presentation today. So thank you. This thank you, Bonnie. Sure. This concludes our webinar today. We'd like to thank you all for joining us. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 trainings and webinars for the year 2021. Please feel free to check out our website calendar and register for any of those upcoming trainings that may be of interest to you. We'd also like to suggest that our short evaluation will be coming to you after today's live presentation, and we urge you please to fill that out. Again, thank you, Brian, and thank you everybody for your attendance today. Happy New Year and have a good day. Thank you all. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye, thanks.